Thank you, Mr. G. The March 23rd, 2022 meeting of the Land Use Committee will come to order. It is 2 p.m. I'm Dan Strauss, Chair of the Committee. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Peterson? Present. Councilmember Nelson? Councilmember Mosqueda? Present. Vice Chair Morales? Here. Chair Strauss? Present. Four present. Thank you. Uh, we have four items on today's agenda, a public hearing, briefing, and vote on Council Bill 120265, which extends the Bringing Business Home Bill for six months while permanent regulations are finalized. We have a briefing and discussion and a vote on Council Bill 120207, Council Member Peterson and I's tree service provider legislation. We have a briefing discussion and vote on Resolution 32048, which ratifies countywide planning policies and a briefing on the strategy on the industrial maritime strategies process. I do see that we have been joined by Councilmember Nelson, and so we have a full committee here today. And before we begin, if there is no objection, the agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the agenda is adopted. At this time, we will open the remote public comment period for items on today's agenda. If you have called in to sign up for the public hearing, please do note that at the start of your comments and then we will hold you over for the public hearing which is separate from public comment and before we begin i ask that everyone please be patient as we learn to operate this new system in real time as a reminder public comment is limited to items on today's agenda while it remains our strong intent to have public comment regularly included on meeting agendas the city council reserves the right to end or eliminate these public comment periods at any point if we deem that the system is being abused or is unsuitable for allowing our meetings to be conducted efficiently and in the manner in which we are able to conduct our necessary business. I will, um, seeing as we have 18 people signed up today, I am going to limit comments to one minute um, and I will extend the public comment from 10 minutes to 20 minutes. So the public comment period for this meeting is up to 20 minutes and each speaker will be given one minute to speak. I will call on each speaker by name and in the order in which they registered on the council's website. If you have not yet registered to speak and would like to, you can sign up before the end of public comment by going to the council's website. The public comment link is also listed on today's agenda. The public comment, the, the line to call is different than the council listen line and is included in the email from registering for public comment. Once I call on a speaker's name, staff will unmute the appropriate microphone and an automatic prompt if you've been unmuted will be your cue that it is your turn to speak. Please begin speaking by stating your name and the item which you are addressing. Speakers will hear a chime when 10 seconds are left of the allotted time. Once a speaker hears the chime, we ask you please begin to wrap up your public comments. If speakers do not end their comments at the end of the allotted time provided, the speaker's microphone will be muted after 10 seconds to allow us to call on the next speaker. Once you've completed your public comment, we ask that you please disconnect from the line and if you plan to continue following this meeting, please do so via the Seattle channel or the listening options listed on the agenda. Again, there is a separate public hearing for item one, Council Bill 120265, the extension of the Bringing Business Home Bill. If your comments are about item number one, please reserve them for the appropriate hearing. The public comment period is now open and we will begin with the first speaker on the list. Uh, Joshua Morris is signed up first, though, Joshua, you are not present at this time. Please take a moment to dial in. I'm going to read everyone's name in the order in which you registered, uh, and then we'll call I'll call a series of three names at a time. So we have Joshua Morris, Ryan DeRamo, Laura Lowe, Ryan Donahue, Judy A. I'm sorry, Judy, I don't want to say your name incorrectly. Rachel Ludwig, Julie Albin, John Marshoni, Joshua Curtis, Steve Zemke, June Bruce Bruce, Richard Ellison, Alicia Ruiz, Jane Foy, Jessica Dixon, Sanders Latour, and Regina Gebkin. Regina and Joshua are not present at this time. Please do call into the phone number provided on your registration email. All of that said, we will get started. Joshua, I'm going to put you to the end of the list just for efficiency's sake. So up first, we have Ryan DeRamo, followed by Laura Lowe, and then Ryan Donahue. Good afternoon, Ryan DeRamo. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Please take it away. Okay. All right. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a homeowner in Seattle, and I want to talk about the tree policy and the housing growth target. First up, trees. Let's support adding trees in the right-of-way. What if we looked at swapping two parking spaces per block for trees? We could add 40,000 new trees. I think everybody would support this. 
Uh, but secondly, I want to comment on the targets in Resolution 32048. I don't know where the planners at King County have been, but 112,000 homes and 170,000 jobs for 25 years is so low they should be embarrassed. Seattle has added that many jobs in the last nine years alone. We are lapping job expectations, and our housing can't keep up because it's constrained. The reality is jobs are growing twice your expectations. So you need to double that to 350,000 jobs and adjust the housing growth target so we don't push more people into homelessness. We need more housing than this. Thank you, Ryan. Up next, we have Laura Lowe, followed by Ryan Donahue, and then Judy A. Laura Lowe, please take it away. Hello, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I'm calling on behalf of Share the Action, Share the City's Action Fund. We want a future Seattle with 12 flexes and rooftop gardens. Four floors and corner stories is not a bold enough vision. We want neighbors who don't have the funds for a down payment on a house to be able to choose to live within walking distance of our parks. Seattle's tree protections have partially failed because of our bad zoning. 75% of where we're experiencing deforestation in our urban tree canopy is in our neighborhood residential zones. Council Bill 120207 to create a tree service provider registration is one small step to address the problem. Although not under consideration today, we also want you to move the oversight of trees out from SDCI and make it its own budget item that can be tracked year to year, maybe under Office of Sustainability and Environment or Department of Neighborhoods who oversee historic preservation. Saving our trees is way more important than saving the show box. As a renter in the U.S. district, I spent thousands of dollars taking care of a tree because my out-of-state landlord wouldn't. We can't expect that at renters especially when we don't have rent stabilization or rent control and can't plan to see the benefits of our investments in our trees. We need a city managed plan, 30% tree cover by 2030. Thank you, Laura. Up next, we have Ryan Donahue, followed by Judy A and then Rachel Ludwig. Ryan, please take it away. Hello. Hello, thank you. My name is Ryan Donahue and I'm the Advocacy and Policy Director for Habitat for Humanity, Seattle King and King South County. I'm here to provide comment on resolution 32048. As we continue to face a massive housing shortage and try to address the crisis that we're all facing, the work of this committee in particular is going to determine whether we finally address this crisis or if we continue to kick the can down the road. As outlined, I know the growth targets uh, are certainly higher actually than any other city across King County. And I do applaud you for doing that. However, as uh, other commenters have said, I would urge you to consider what happens when the need ends up exceeding those current targets. The reality is if we wanna get serious about meaningfully addressing growth, we need to be making sure that our land use codes are in alignment with where they actually need to be. One crucial part of the solution will be opening up more space for more types of housing. According to research from Zillow, if we added just one in every 10 single family lots in the Seattle Metro area had two instead of one unit, we'd add over 125,000 units. That is a significant improvement, and we can do even more. So thank you very much. I would encourage you to consider that moving forward. Thank you, Ryan. Up next, we have Judy A. And Judy, if you could tell me how to pronounce your last name, followed by Rachel Ludwig, and then Julie Albin. Judy, good, good afternoon. Hi, my name is Judy. Hi, my name is Judy Acolytis, speaking for Agenda Item 2. Recently, three healthy 80-year-old trees were removed from a newly purchased property in three hours. The tree company said a permit was not needed. However, another potential buyer of the property had measured those same trees, and one of the trees was definitely too large in circumference to be removed without a permit. It was an illegal cut. With this bill, that tree might still be here, sucking carbon out of our air and helping to prevent 106-degree summer days. I ask you to please allow for 14 days for posting a tree removal notice on private property, the same time as stop planting strips. Please vote yes for CB12027 and adopt amendments from Council Members Peterson and Strauss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Up next, we have Rachel Ludwig, followed by Julie Albin, and then John Marchioni. Rachel, good afternoon. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, hi, I'm Rachel Ludwig. Um, I live uh, Beacon Hill, actually, and I'm also commenting on uh, Agenda 2. So my main concern with regulations as proposed is that I live in an already multifamily 
area and the way development goes on in our neighborhood makes it impossible like currently makes it very hard for us to keep trees on lots and still provide homes and it's very important for climate change reasons that we encourage people to live in a dense area and so uh, my concern is that we can't aren't these regulations aren't doing enough uh, or really anything to encourage that development to take place and keep existing trees because we are actually going to have more heat events and those trees are most critical not for sucking carbon out of the air but for making our cities livable um, as climate change is happening as we try to work to reduce uh, the impacts of climate change we need people to live in our cities to do to reduce those impacts so i'm very concerned they're not doing enough um, we also as someone previously said we aren't doing enough to ensure that we build trees equitably because depending on the redevelopment to get more tree canopy and like Thank isn't you. enough because yeah it depends on the other who's being you know redeveloped which is only happens in wealthier areas and Thank you, Rachel. If you have more comments, please do send them into our office. Uh, and thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Julie Albin, followed by John Marshoni and then Joshua Curtis. Julie, please take it away. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Okay, perfect. Good afternoon. Um, hi, my name is Julie Albin. I just wanted to comment on a recent incident um, that happened pretty timely to today's meeting. Um, my partner and I just bought a home in Maple Leaf in December. We've been really loving all the large trees in the neighborhood. One in particular was a, a gorgeous large coast redwood on the side of our neighbor's yard, which provided shade, habitat for birds, and just really a gorgeous relaxing view at our backyard and bedroom windows. Um, unfortunately, just yesterday, the tree was removed by a well-known tree removal company who's known for removing trees illegally. Um, they did not have a permit, um, and we really don't see any reason um, to remove this, this gorgeous beauty. Um, we are working with landscape architect for our own yard who said it was nearly certain it was close to being an exceptional tree that should have definitely had a permit to be removed if it even should have been removed at all. Um, it would be really great to include the additional amendment um, to Bill 120207, which would prohibit any tree service provider from working in Seattle for a full year if they have two or more violations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have jo John Marshoni, former mayor of Redmond, Joshua Curtis, and followed by Steve Zemke. Mr. Mayor, please take it away. Well, actually, I am John Marshoni, executive director of the Public Stadium Authority, which owns Lumen Field. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of the PSA at Lumen Field and Event Center. Um, our board member, and I'm speaking to item number four, the industrial and maritime land. Uh, our board members have participated in several mayoral processes since 2011 on maritime and industrial lands. In 2019, we asked to remove the stadium area from the MIC. Uh, we participated in the last process, and now that that process is completed, we, along with the Public Facilities District, remain convinced that the stadium area is unlike any other industrial land under discussion. Removing the stadium area from the MIC, given how unique it is, two large stadiums, an event center, two historic neighborhoods, um, it would just be the prudent thing to do. So broad policies that should be created for the MIC that don't fit the stadiums can be created for everyone's benefit. Thank you. Thank you, John. Mr. Mayor, um, followed by Joshua Curtis, then Steve Zemke, uh, and followed by June Blue Spruce. Joshua, great to have you back. Thank you, council member. <clears throat> so yes, this is Joshua Curtis. I'm the executive director of the Washington State Ballpark Public Facilities District. We provide public oversight to the operations of T-Mobile Park and share an interest in ensuring that our neighborhood is walkable, safe, and vibrant. So I am also providing public comment related to item number four. The PFD continues to partner with the PSA on sharing our vision of what we would like um, our neighborhood to look like. And I would echo all of John's comments I'd also like to note that our two organizations recently hired a consultant to help analyze the economic feasibility of the proposed building prototypes in the DEIS. We think there's actually a proposal that would work well in this area. It would prohibit housing in the first two floors of any building and prioritize light industrial and commercial with the possibility of workforce housing above. This prototype would also work well if you applied the multifamily tax exemption. We would encourage the city to consider the option of removing our area from the MIC. We think there's an opportunity to meet multiple goals of creating industrial jobs, workforce housing, and a neighborhood around the stadium that is complementary to its location and recognizes its evolution. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Joshua. Up next, we have Steve Zemke, 
followed by June Blue Spruce and then Richard Ellison. I will note Joshua Morris and Regina Gebkin are not present. If you would like to call in, please call in to the phone number provided in the registration email you should have received <clears throat> for public comment. Steve, welcome. Please take it away. Steve, I see you there. If you want to press star six, not pound six, but star six. We'll let your t now, is, now is the moment. And Mr. G, why don't you bring up June Blue Spruce and um, we'll come back to Steve. June, welcome. Hello, thank you so much. I want to thank all responsible for the tree service provider le registration legislation item two, um, particularly council members Peterson and Strauss for your amendments. I strongly support substitute bill one with those amendments uh, included. Obviously we need comprehensive tree protection legislation, but for environmental review. So forward. I particularly appreciate the delineation of specifics regarding hazardous tree removal. Thank you for that. The one thing done a lot to make practice cons uh, consistent between SDCI and SDOT. However, the one area where you didn't do that is in the length of uh, time that a permit needs to be, or a notice needs to be posted. I strongly uh, encourage you to change that to two weeks for SDCI as well as SDOT. And we need one agency in charge of tree protection in this city. Thank you. Thank you, June. Steve, are you able to come off of mute? Star six at this time. We'll come back to Steve. Richard Ellison followed by Alicia Ruiz and then Jane Foy. Richard, welcome, good afternoon. Hi. 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 Hello, council members. My name is Richard Ellison. Uh, Richard, just real quick, uh, you're you're quite you're very quiet, uh, clerk. If you could, I don't know if you're using a headset, but any better? A little bit. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. A little uh, bit hello, better. council members. My name is Richard Ellison, and I live in the Wedgwood community, a neighborhood that pri had prides on its big trees. Please vote yes for substitute bill SB 12207 and all amendments from Chairperson Strauss and Council Member Peterson. Seattle has been waiting decades to improve its private property tree protection and arborist rest restoration is, is registration, excuse me, is already required by SDOT for tree work for many years now. Over a weekend a few years ago, I saw some big trees being cut at the Wedgwood Pool. The neighbor filed a complaint. By the time the inspector came, out the next week, the stumps have been completely ground down and no violation was identified. The tree company, a major company, might not have cut the trees if it required threatening their license to cut an exceptional tree. Substitute Bill 12207 also supports improved requirements on how exceptional trees are identified as hazardous to present, prevent misuse of the category. Because subdivision developments are causing tremendous tree losses, particularly important since Amendment 3, codifying guidance for the sub division Thank you, uh, developments to, to maximize conservation. Thank you, Richard. And please do feel free to email in any further comments. Um, Steve, I see you're off mute. So Alicia, before you go, I'm going to have Steve go since we were having some technical problems. Uh, Steve, please take it away. Yeah, this is Steve Zemke. I'm chair of TREEPAC and uh, we support the uh, legislation here to require uh, registration of tree service providers. Uh, we note that um, this is something that FDOT already has been doing for nine years, and uh, eight states nationally uh, already require this type of tree service, reg in their states require a tree service registration. It includes California, Connecticut, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Minnesota, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. I do have concern about putting tree service providers on retainer rather than being employee because this is not what most of these other states do. And also strongly support the public 
noticed, noting that we personally, about 10 years ago, had a, had a pickup truck uh, in our driveway ready to cut down a tree when we came home and asked what they were doing, and they said, we're cutting it down. So who said that? And it was a neighbor, and it was Thank our you, tree. Man. That's why public voted. Thank you, Steve. And please do feel free to write in with any further comments. Alicia Ruiz, followed by Jane Foy, and then Jessica Dixon. Alicia, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Ruiz. I'm the Seattle Government Affairs Manager for the Master Builders Association of King and Snohomish County, representing nearly 3,000 members. Um, I'm calling in today to um, ask you to vote no on Amendment Number 3 for uh, the tree provider service providers bill. Um, there are several serious problems with <clears throat> this proposed amendment. Uh, first of all, tree care professionals are not experts on land use or platting matters and are wholly unqualified to uh, opine on the rela relationships of lot lines and other platting issues to trees. Secondly, the underlying platting criteria cited in this amendment is unclear and very subjective. Various SDCI staff give various meanings to the provision and the hearing examiner um, has also had issues about the meaning of this provision. Furthermore, it puts the emphasis on the tree retention rather than promoting rational platting of properties to support the reasonable development of housing. And finally, it will increase the cost of development and lead to further appeals, project delays, and ultimately... Thank you, Alicia. And please do feel free to write in with any more comments. I did see you emailed the committee today. Followed by uh, next... Up is Jane Foy, followed by Jessica Dixon, and then Sanders Lecture. We have Joshua Morris not present, Regina Gifton not present, and Suzanne Grant. I see you've signed up, and yet you're not present at the moment either. Jane, if you want to mute how you are watching this presentation, it will eliminate the feedback, and I'll let you take it away at this time. Take it away, Jane. Okay. My name is Jane Foy. I'm calling in of CB120207. I think it is very important to have reputable tree service providers register with Seattle Department of Construction and Inspection, just like Seattle Department of Transportation. This is an overdue needed action that you can take today. We have lost numerous trees in my neighborhood due to illegal cutting just within this past year. I support CB120207 and all the amendments except allowing tree providers one violation a year. To me, this just doesn't make any sense at all. Also, I feel that tree protection should be handled by the Office of Sustainability and Environment and not by the Seattle Department of Auction and Inspection. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Up next, we have Jessica Dixon, followed by Sanders Lachur, then Ted Lehman, and lastly, Suzanne Grant, Joshua Morris, Regina Gebkin. If Joshua or Regina are listening and would like to speak, you are signed up, yet not present. This time, Jessica, welcome. I see you're off mute. Take it away. Hi, thank you. My name is Jessica Dixon, and today I'm representing Plant Amnesty. Plant Amnesty's board and membership, many of whom are professional arborists, urge council members to vote yes today for CB12207 and all published amendments from council member Peterson and Chair Strauss. We've waited years for better policies to conserve Seattle's mature trees and urban forest canopy, so please don't delay adoption of this bill. We have sent a letter to council members in advance of this meeting supporting the existing amendments and outlining some additional policies we would like to see addressed by this bill and subsequent legislation. They include um, extending the posting notice to two weeks to match SDOT's posting schedule since any questions or concerns typically take more than three days to resolve. Um, requiring all tree service provider trucks to have their company name clearly displayed on their vehicles as well as the registration sticker with city phone number or website to citizens to verify registration. Um, and in addition, along with our mission to teach best practices to homeowners and organizations through our slate of classes, um, we Thank strongly you, support the creation of a program to... Thank you, Jessica, and please do feel free to email in any further comments. Uh, up next, we have Sanders Latour, followed by Ted Lehman, and then Suzanne Grant. Sanders, please take it away. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Sanders Latour, and I am a resident of District 7, and I am commenting on agenda item 3. 
from the city last started working on the comprehensive plan update in 2014, the median rent in Seattle, according to the U.S. Census, was $1,131. In the six years since, the median rent has increased more than 50% to $1,702. That is due to high amounts of job growth and population growth in Seattle. We've seen we've added 80% of our target jobs to the area since 2015. That sounds great, but we plan to hit our target in 2035, not 2025. Seattle was exploding in growth. There is a recent poll from Axios that said that Seattle was the number one place college students wanted to move to post-graduation. Only targeting 112,000 housing units in the one Seattle plan will result in even higher rent prices going forward. Realistic targets now will inform zoning changes later during the one Seattle planning process. Thank you. Thank you, Sanders. Just last call for Joshua and Regina. Please do call in if you'd like to speak. We have two speakers remaining, Ted Lehman and Suzanne Grant. Ted, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, my name is I'm a member of the Seattle Industrial Coalition, a group advocating for a true mixed-use TOD vision in the SOTO, especially around the new light rail stations. I also participated in Mayor Durkin's Maritime and Industrial Lands Council and was one of the many participants who were opposed to the all-or-nothing choice provided at the end. Touting an 85% consensus is a bit misleading because it includes people that felt they needed to vote yes on dubious recommendations or risk getting nothing. That being said, I appreciate that our group was recently invited by the city to weigh in on the proposed prototypes by CAI, the city's consulting firm. We reached out to many of our contacts in the real estate development space to provide realistic cost inputs and revenue assumptions. And across the board, the prototype significantly forget to the city from Jack McCullough, Peter Nitza, and me. We offered an alternative prototype that does pencil out and would attract investment interest from outside parties but it acknowledges that newer industrial space will only get built if significant office and housing are part of the mix. The whole concept behind a light rail system is that people live adjacent to their jobs and reduce you, their Ted. reliance on single occupancy cars. Thank you, Ted, and please do feel free to email in any further comments. We're not taking this bill up today. It's just a briefing. Uh, last up, we have Suzanne Grant, Joshua Morris, and Regina. If you're listening, please call in now. Suzanne is our last caller for the day. Suzanne, welcome. Good afternoon. I see you're there. Uh, star six, Suzanne. Not pound six, star six. Mr. G, can we make sure that's the right phone number for her? That would appear to be. Hello. Oh, oh, there, she is. Oh, there we are. Thank you, Mr. G. Suzanne, I, good afternoon. Suzanne. Hello. Take it Hello, away. Chair Strauss. I support CB12207 and the amendments proposed by CM Peterson and Chair Strauss. All the old trees in Seattle are falling to the ground. From the city limits all the way to Puget Sound. The people who are cutting them come from everywhere. They may not have a permit or be registered, but they don't care. They are the murderers, the tree murderers. They keep a cutting, 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 cutting them down. Please do what you can to save what is left of our mature and exceptional trees. We need these people to be registered who are cutting our trees. I have to pay for a license in Seattle. I'm a music teacher. Electricians, plumbers, they need to pay. These people need to be registered. Save our trees to save yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, as always, Suzanne. Always great to hear you. Uh, just double checking, Mr. G, I see Joshua Morris and Regina Gebkin not present. Can you confirm they are not present and that we have no further public comment registrants at this time? Affirmative, there are no further public comment registrants. Thank you, Mr. G. Seeing as we have no additional speakers remotely present, we will move on to the next agenda item. Uh, item number one, our first Agenda item is Council Bill 120265, which extends the bringing business <coughs> home legislation for six months while final uh, legislation is uh, created. Mr. Ahn, will you please read the abbreviated title into the record? Item 1, Council Bill 120265, an ordinance relating to land use regulation of home occupations extending for six months interim development controls established by Ordinance 126293. Thank you, Mr. Ahn. Uh, before we begin our public comment, public hearing, we're joined by Keto Freeman of Council Central staff. 
I briefed the committee two weeks ago on the work we did last year on the original Bring Business Home legislation, and Keitel is here today for a formal briefing to answer any questions you, you may have. So, Mr. Freeman, please take it away. Uh, sure. Thanks, uh, Chair Strauss. Um, today, the committee will hold a public hearing and may make a recommendation on Council Bill 120265. Um, that bill would extend for six months interim development regulations that were put in place um, through Ordinance 126293 about a year ago. Um, Council Bill 120265 is pretty straightforward, just provides for a six month extension. It does have a ratify and confirm clause. Um, Ordinance 126293 will expire on April 21st. Um, so Ordinance 120265, the bill, Council Bill 120265, should it pass, um, uh, would ratify um, actions taken after council passage, but uh, before the effective date of the bill. Um, Councilmember Strauss uh, gave a briefing at the last committee meeting. I'm happy to walk through um, uh, the presentation um, related to Ordinance 126293 just to refresh your memory before uh, the public hearing, if that's useful. Okay. Let me share my screen here. Can you all see that? Should be a should be a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> uh, full screen mode. Uh, so just to refresh your memories here a little bit, uh, uh, council members, about a year ago, the council passed ordinance one two six two nine three, known uh, as the Bringing Business Home um, legislation. Um, that legislation established interim development controls. Um, related to home occupations in neighborhood residential and uh, multifamily zones. The purpose of the bill is to provide temporary um, regulatory flexibility for home-based businesses to allow those home-based businesses to uh, continue operating during uh, uh, the COVID pandemic um, with fewer restrictions and allow small businesses to remain operating um, to speed the economic recovery after several emergency restrictions are lifted. Um, kind of the instant case for this was uh, um, Yonder Cider, which was operating out of a garage um, in somebody's home in uh, Finney Ridge. Um, Yonder Cider was cited by SDCI um, and these regulations allowed um, Yonder Cider to continue operating. I understand now that their um, tasting room um, has moved to a brick and mortar um, location in Ballard. So um, prior to the interim controls, how did the city regulate home occupations? Um, home, uh, the city of Seattle has a regular, a, a sort of a, a relatively permissive um, regulatory regime for home occupations. A permit is not required. A land use permit is not required to operate a home occupation. Instead, there are performance standards that apply to home occupations. Um, somebody who has a home occupation may need to get a permit for some um, type of physical improvement to their property, but they don't need a land use permit. Um, the performance standards were primarily um, uh, are primarily um, limitations around um, activities that may be seen as nuisance activities in a residential zone. So there is a limitation on the number of commercial vehicle deliveries and pickups. Um, there's a requirement that um, customer visits be by appointment only. Um, the residential appearance of a home of a home must be maintained. So if it's a multifamily home, single family home, that residential appearance must be maintained. Um, there can be no more than two um, non-residents of the dwelling who can work at the home occupation. Uh, the home occupation cannot substantially increase traffic and on-street on -street parking in the vicinity. Um, signs identifying the business cannot exceed 64 square inches. That's pretty small. That's, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's less than one square foot in size. Outdoor storage cannot be associated with the home occupation. So you can't have materials that you use in your home occupation stored outdoors. And there are limitations on noise, odor, dust, light glare, and other kind of uh, standard nuisance, nuisance impacts that apply to home occupations. So what changed under ordinance 126293? Um, the number of employees um, was modified. Uh, it, could, it could be an unlimited number of employees working in a home occupation. There could be um, the type of customer visit um, was also modified, no longer needs to be by appointment only. Um, there can be walk-up visits to a home occupation and uh, the limitations on increased traffic and parking demand were also modified. There are a couple of clarifications around the increased, um, uh, around the limitations on increased uh, traffic and parking demand that were made um, by amendment at full council um, when the council was considering um, uh, ordinance 126293 and that clarified that you cannot have um, a drive-in business that is a home occupation 
and also for certain types of home occupations like automotive uh, retail sales and service. So if you're working on cars um, in your garage, you also can't increase traffic and parking demand. So those regulations were maintained. Um, additionally, um, Ordinance 126293 um, allowed home occupations to have a larger non-illuminated sign about 720 square feet, which is about five square feet, and allowed home occupations, clarified that home occupations can use required accessory use parking uh, for the home occupation purpose. So for example, if you were using your garage um, as a tasting room, um, that would be permitted um, under the interim regulations. Um, so oops, I'm going in the wrong direction here. So that's, that's a summary of uh, what Ordinance 126293 um, did. Um, just to return uh, to the current bill, um, that of course would extend these regulations for an additional six month period to allow SDCI more time to develop a proposal for permanent regulations and also to allow um, home based occupations that have taken advantage of the change in regulations um, to continue operating um, while the pandemic is ongoing. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, the last things that you said I think are most important is that uh, OPC SDCI is taking the time to create the final. Uh, regulations, uh, permanent regulations, so that we can take that up. This extension is to give them the time and, and ensure that we continue at the level playing field so that folks don't have to shut up shop and then reopen shop just because we lapsed. Can you remind me uh, what, when do the current regulations expire and will adopting this extension next week allow us to avoid that gap in these? In the... oh, you're on mute, Mr. Freeman. The current regulations expire on April 21st, and so there's no avoiding a gap. Um, the proposed bill has a ratifying confirmed pause. So um, any take any action taken by SDCI after council approval, but before the bill becomes effective, um, are ratified and confirmed by the council. So for example, if there was an enforcement action against a home based occupation that occurred um, after passage by the council, but before the bill became effective, um, SDC and SDCI um, uh, uh, modified their, their um, inspection compliance response based on um, the future regulations becoming effective, um, that action would be ratified by the bill. Wonderful. Thank you. Colleagues, uh, I know I did my best playing central staff on TV at the last committee. Uh, do you have questions for Mr. Freeman? Well, Keto, it looks like it didn't. Okay, uh, uh, Councilmember Nelson, please take it away. Uh, you're still on mute. Hello, sorry about that. Um, so I asked this last time, and maybe Keto, you can speak to this. Um, how? How? I basically said. So, how has it been going? Um, uh, and uh, do we have any information about? new businesses that have developed that have been facilitated by this legislation since it's been in effect? Uh, the short answer to that is we don't know. And that partly has to do with the existing regulatory regime. So prior to um, the bill passing, um, the city did not require any land use permits for a home occupation. You just had to meet the performance standards. Um, so we don't actually know how many um, uh, businesses are operating out of people's homes. We didn't know prior to the pandemic and we don't know now. Um, so the only thing we can rely on is anecdotal evidence, and for that, um, uh, you, you know, your sources are as good as mine. It's what you read in the paper. Okay. Well, uh, that was my question. Thank you. Oh, great. And Councilmember Nelson, you raise a really important point, and that's one of the things that I do want to see changed in the permanent regulations. Uh, I don't need to see a, a cost or a fee associated with the permit. And right now, the best way for us to try to figure it out is by looking at business permits that are existing in residential areas. And that just if we had a, a permit for home-based businesses, we could have better data. Um, again, I, I wouldn't want to put another fee on top of them, though. Got it. I do have other comments, but that's about the, the bill in general. So I, I don't know if now is the time. Yeah, I'd say take it away. OK. Um, so last year when this, um, when council voted on this, I wrote to, to the full council um, as a citizen and as a, uh, someone with small business experience. And um, I basically, let me say right now, I'm going to vote for this thing. 
All right. But I'm going to go through my issues. Um, so what I said last year and what I still feel is that um, in last year, March, um, middle of the pandemic, I wrote in saying basically, if you want to help small businesses right now, there are a lot of things that council can do. And this seemed like a distraction because it's it's changing the land use code, which is pretty significant for um, home-based businesses. And it didn't seem like there were very many home-based businesses that were um, clamoring for a land use change. I understand that there were a couple um, a couple of businesses that had, had, had reached out. So um, I was, that was my main point. And I also took umbrage that um, this, uh, this legislation was being um, put forward as leveling of the playing field, because in fact, it confers added advantage to home-based businesses. Uh, home-based businesses do not have to pay rent, in, in commercial rents. They don't have to, business owners don't have to put up um, guarantees or their homes basically to um, to back a bank loan to have a, um, uh, you know, a business in a brick and mortar and all of them, they don't have to pay utility bills, et cetera. So saying that it, um, that it uh, levels the playing field, um, if you ever tried to get a commercial space and start a business, um, it seems like it, it, it just the opposite. Um, I also, uh, I, I am completely for uh, small business incubation, and that's one thing that I asked about last time, which was, um, how did it work? Because I want to see home-based businesses move into um, larger spaces. I want them to, to succeed, expand, and thrive, and ultimately um, contribute to the vitality of our neighborhood business districts. And so I was happy to see that, that you know, I want it to be an incubation and I, it's not clear to me. And that's, this is some information that I'm going to need to ultimately get behind um, making these things permanent or these code changes or this program permanent, because that's the goal. I want businesses to thrive and I want them to contribute to uh, the vitality of their neighborhoods. Ultimately, um, I haven't heard very much about impacts uh, to neighborhoods, what residents, you know, living next door or on the same street, I would, I really will want to see that kind of outreach. Um, and uh, let me see. Uh, uh, there are lots of models for small business incubators that I can get into. And basically, um, uh, anyway, um, so, so, I, I'm not worried about the competition. I think that the kind of business that sets up shop in a garage is different than the kind of business that would, um, you know, so th that would set out looking for a, uh, a commercial space in a neighborhood um, business district. So that is not what motivated me then and it's not what's motivating me now, but I really do think that there needs to be outreach to our BIAs and neighborhood chambers and that they, um, other businesses might feel differently that um, they're putting in all this other, um, all these other resources to be able to set up shop in, in a brick and mortar someplace. And um, I just wanna make sure that they are aware and, and know how they feel. But, in, but I'm going to vote for this because I support small businesses and, um, and uh, I know that a lot of people are operating in, in their homes and especially um, immigrant community um, and in BIPOC small business owners that, uh, that really don't have the resources to, um, to have a commercial space. So um, those are, I just want those concerns on the record and uh, I look forward to seeing what what we know in six months or so, uh, or or a year, however long this is is pro, um, extended, uh, before um, these things become permanent. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. Appreciate that feedback. Uh, other council members, anyone questions or comments before we open the public hearing? Seeing none, uh, and Clerk Sanchez, can you uh, confirm for me, we don't have any public comment registrants remotely present for this public hearing. Do I need to open and close? Do I need to read the script? Can you advise me on my next steps? If you wouldn't mind, Chair, just stating that you're opening up the public hearing and um, just verifying there's no public commenters and then closing it, at, closing the public hearing. You do not need to read the entire script. Thank you, Clerk. 
uh, at this time, uh, just confirming there are no further questions or comments before we open the public hearing. Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing. Um, before we be open the public hearing, uh, uh, let's see, where is this? The public hearing on Council Bill 120265 is now open. Uh, we will begin with the speakers on the list. Um, Mr. G, Mr. Ahn, can you confirm with me that there are no public comment registrants remotely present for the public hearing on Council Bill 120265? There are no public hearing registrants. Thank you, Mr. G. At this time, I do not have anyone remotely pre present to speak. Uh, staff has confirmed that there are not members of the public in the queue before closing this public hearing. And so I will now close the public hearing. Public hearing on Council Bill 120265 is now closed. Uh, colleagues, given that this is the second meeting we have had to discuss the legislation and that there is already a gap in this uh, ex uh, legislation, I and that this is an extension of legislation we have already adopted last year, I will ask that we suspend the rules today to vote on legislation, to vote the legislation out of committee. Voting today will allow us to keep the extension on track so there's uh, not a larger gap in the interim regulations. Colleagues, any concerns with suspending the rules the same day as the public, to vote out the bill as the same day as the public hearing? Seeing none, I move to suspend the rules to allow for a vote on Council Bill 120265 on the same day as a public hearing. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded to suspend the rules to allow for a vote on the on Council Bill 120265 on the same day as the public hearing. Will the clerk please call the roll? Bird uh, Peterson. Abstain. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. Councilmember Mosqueda. Aye. Vice Chair Morales. Yes. Chair Strauss. Yes. Four in favor, uh, none opposed, one abstention. Thank you. Uh, the motion carries and Council Bill 120265 passes. Um, now, the rules have been suspended. Now we move to passage. <laughs> uh, is there any further discussion before we vote on the bill? Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm glad there's an opportunity for a quick comment just to say thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for bringing this legislation forward. I'm excited that we have the opportunity to vote on this legislation to provide businesses already serving as a springboard uh, for our smallest businesses and our local economy to be able to continue this good work. Uh, you know, a huge amount of appreciation for folks like Yonder Cider, which started out as a small business operating out of a garage, and they, as a great example, got some good coverage of their ability to transition into a tap room, a commercial space, which was due to um, the great work of this uh, body and uh, your leadership, Mr. Chair. I think it's a great success story in these times as we're looking to recover in a more equitable way mm -hmm. post pandemic and to make sure that we are looking at how Seattle can have resilient local economy that is thriving and diverse. I think it also makes our neighborhoods more diverse, thriving and vibrant. And I look forward to um, hearing more about the newest businesses that will continue to crop up as we think about ways for folks to walk around their local um, community and see uh, how they can support local businesses operating by our neighbors throughout our community. So looking forward to supporting this legislation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Mosqueda. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, I move recommend to recommend passage of Council Bill 120265 is there a second? Second. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded to recommend passage of Council Bill 120265. Will the clerk please call the roll? Member Peterson. Abstain. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. Councilmember Mosqueda. Aye. Vice Chair Morales. Yes. Chair Strauss. Yes. Four in favor, none opposed, one abstention. Thank you. The motion carries Council Bill 120265 passes and the legislation will be at full council next Tuesday for a final vote. Thank you, colleagues. Moving on to much anticipated and waited 
legislation. Our next item is Council Bill 120207, which requires tree service providers to register with the city. Mr. Ahn, will you please read the abbreviated title into the record? Agenda item two, Council Bill 120207, an ordinance relating to land use in urban forestry, adding a tree service provider registration procedure and requirement. Thank you, Mr. Ahn. This legislation was introduced by Councilmember Peterson. I am excited, happy, and honored to be co-sponsor with him in this effort. Councilmember Peterson, would you like to take it away as the, as the prime sponsor? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, Chair Strauss. And I also wanna thank Yolanda Ho on Central Staff who's been helping us with this bill throughout and my staff and your staff and, and everybody who's worked on this. Um, thank you for scheduling Council Bill 120207 for a vote out of committee today and for your hard work on it, Chair Strauss. Colleagues, as you may recall, this bill to register tree service providers who want to exceed routine, routine pruning or cut down trees was introduced last October and we walked through the specifics at our committee on February 9th. Uh, the amendments published with today's agenda reflect much of the discussion we had last month and I urge you to support all of these amendments. I know we'll discuss them individually here. <laughs> Passing out of committee today, this Council Bill 120207 will be a small but mighty step to increase transparency and accountability by simply having tree service providers register with our city government before they cut down more trees. In the midst of the climate crisis inflicting severe heat waves, let's not have any more trees sawed to death in the middle of the night by chainsaws wielded by unknown tree cutters. Let's daylight these operations on a registry for all to see. Professional arborists who care about trees and follow the rules already already register with the city for removing trees on public land. And this bill will create that transparent and accountable process for all other properties in our Emerald City and our Evergreen State. Due to the horrible heat waves last year, we saw once again the negative disparate impacts to communities that have seen a loss of tree canopy and experienced harmful heat island effects. Increasing accountability and transparency by registering tree service providers who cut down or heavily prune trees should improve compliance with current and future protections of Seattle's trees and help those neighborhoods most at risk of losing more trees. I wanna thank the dozens of tree advocates who already know very well the environmental and health benefits of existing mature trees. And it was steadfastly urged the council to do more about the city's dwindling tree canopy. Similar to what we saw in February, we saw during the past 24 hours, dozens of emails asking us to pass this council bill today. I want to thank those who took time to call in today. Um, also the Seattle Audubon Society, we did just get an email from them. Tree Pack, Friends of Seattle's Urban Forest, heard from many of these same supporters for the past two years. Uh, in addition to this support from emails and public commenters, there is a statistically significant survey conducted throughout Seattle last year that showed 77% support a registration system. So we're here today to hopefully pass it out of committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. Well said. Um, we are joined by Yolanda Ho, Council Central Staff, who will walk us through the legislation again, as, as well as three amendments that have been proposed. Uh, in, including one of them as a substitute that wrapped up a lot of the amendments that have been in discussion over the last few weeks. Yolanda, would you like to take it away? Sure, thank you. Um, let me get my screen shared here. Is that good? Great, thank you. So um, I think we had a good introduction by Councilmember Peterson, but um, so my intention with this presentation is to uh, describe Council Bill 120207 that would establish a requirement that tree service providers register with the city prior to conducting commercial tree work on private property. As a reminder, the city already has a tree service provider registry that is administered by the Seattle Department of Transportation, also known as SDOT. It is only for entities doing work on trees in the public right of way. Um, we did discuss the potential impacts of the bill at the meeting on February 9th. So we will instead today focus on some of the key points from the Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections implementation analysis, which is attached to the agenda today, and then also discuss the potential amendments that have, are attached to the agenda. 
So uh, as a reminder, this legislation would amend Seattle Municipal Code Title 25 to require that uh, Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections, also known as SDCI, establish a registry process and system within 90 days of the effective date of the ordinance. Tree service providers would then have 90 days to register with SDCI following the setup period. After this 90 days, all tree service providers would need to be registered in order to apply for permits or provide tree related reports to SDCI. It would define commercial tree work as conduct major pruning, removal of trees larger than six inches diameter at breast height, and the assessment of tree health or hazard risk for financial compensation. It excludes routine pruning activities that do not meet the threshold of major pruning. It would define tree service provider as an entity engaged in commercial tree work and require that registered tree service providers comply with various best practices related to the specific type of work for which they are engaged, such as maintaining adequate supervision over their workers as they conduct the work, assessing what the appropriate level of tree work is needed to meet the client's objectives to authorize SDCI to create rules as needed to support administration of the registry, amend other sections of Title 23 to align with the legislation's intent, only registered tree, ser tree service providers uh, conduct commercial tree work. And this table uh, was a side-by-side -side comparison of what is being proposed in the legislation before you and SDOT's existing registry system. Um, since we talked about this at length on uh, last month, I will just kind of remind you of the key differences. Uh, here we have the commercial liability insurance coverage is required, but SDCI has discretion to determine what is the appropriate amount. Um, SDOT allows tree service providers to either have a currently credentialed International Society of Arbor Culture certified arborist on staff or retainer, whereas the um, Council Bill 120207 would require that that person be on staff. There is also a shorter public notice requirement um, and a number of folks in the public comment noticed this, noted this. Um, I would just sit, note for you all that the difference acknowledges that the SDCI public notice is more about just letting people know that commercial re tree work is authorized, um, but is not necessarily an appealable decision, right? So that is just something that SDCI acknowledges. And um, whereas SDOT's public notice is actually intended to inform and allow people to appeal the decision, and thus there's kind of that greater span of time um, because these are publicly owned trees, right? So there's a kind of a different of who owns the tree and who's making that decision. Uh, so, and also the penalty would be different uh, if the bill as introduced, um, SDOT would remove so SDOT's current practice is to remove a tree service provider from the registry for a year after it's been issued two notices of violation. The proposed registry would prohibit SDCI from accepting tree-related reports from a tree service provider who has been issued a single notice of violation related to the illegal removal of an exceptional tree. So it kind of ran through that, but um, does anyone have any questions about anything on this slide before I move on? Just That's noting, fine. Yolanda, a lot of these issues have been changed in the substitute. So this was the starting point for the bill that we had at last committee. And uh, council members, maybe it would be helpful if I moved the legislation so that we could take up the substitute that, that makes significant changes to this. Do I see consensus there? Or do other folks have questions at this time? Uh, council member, uh, Vice Chair Morales, please take it away. Sorry, I just have a quick question um, about what it means to resolve a violation uh, in the penalty section. Is that paying a fine? Yeah, that's typically paying a fine or if SDCI withdrew the violation, right? So that those are two kind of pathways. And I just interjecting, I think some of that is that language is cleaned up in the substitute. So let's, I'm going to move the bill so that we can take discuss the substitute at this time. Unless Councilmember Nelson, do you have questions? I see, you know, no. Um, so before we take up amendments, I will place the legislation before us. So I move to recommend passage of Council Bill 120207. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded. Uh, the first of three amendments today is a substitute amendment that Councilmember Peterson and I co-sponsored together. 
this substitute reflects a suite of changes we agreed to and it include that will make this legislation more effective. It includes technical changes, extends the implementation time to five months in line with SDCI's implementation memo and sets a, a date certain November 10th for tree service providers to register by. It allows for tree service providers to have an arborist uh, either on staff or on retainer rather than only on staff and aligns penalties with SDOT's registry so that a tree service provider would be removed from the registry for one year after two violations. And lastly, it adjusts the requirements for tree risk assessment qualification or track requiring that an applicant for hazardous tree removal permit must be track qualified and requiring that for hazardous exceptional trees, a different tree service provider must file the permit rather than uh, as compared to the provider who plans to do the removal. Uh, Yolanda, Councilmember Peterson, did I miss anything? And Yolanda, if you have a different slide that reflects the substitute, I think that's important to have visually on the screen at this time. Yeah, um, well, I, I, that's fine. Um, I, there was just one more slide before I got to that. Uh, I can get, it was that I wanted to talk about the implementation analysis as kind of like just one more piece of new information before we moved into that. But um, I, would you prefer that I go to that slide uh, that shows kind of the track changes version? And then yes, we- I I think just it, there was some confusion just a minute ago. So I think okay. yeah, okay. well here it is and then we can move back to the SDCI implementation analysis I think for folks reference. Um yes, council uh, chair, you did I think you got all the critical points on uh, what is included. Some of those things are not reflected in this table in particular the hazardous tree permit requirements that you note. Um but I am noting in this slide where now there is kind of more consistency between SDOT's registry and what would uh, be in the uh, council bill before you, amended council bill before you. So again, um, noting that ISA certified arborist on staff or retainer, so now that one will match. Public notice would be, there is, that is, sorry, there's another <laughs> amendment, uh, amendment four that would create the business days. Um, then uh, the substitute would also uh, bring the penalty structure into alignment with S thoughts. Very helpful. Uh, Councilmember Peterson, any thoughts on this? I, I agree this slide is very helpful in clearing up some of the earlier questions that so the substitute basically addresses. Thank you. Wonderful. Vice Chair Morales, Councilmember Nelson, Mosqueda, any questions from from you, I'm seeing none. Uh, Yolanda, would you like to finish your presentation? <laughs> Sorry no for problem. interrupting. <laughs> no, it, keeping it fluid, it's all good. <laughs> so, uh, so I just wanted to highlight for the committee that we did receive some additional information be between the committee meeting, uh, the last committee meeting on this subject and today. And um, that implementation memo from SDCI is attached to the memo, I mean, agenda. And so um, SDCI anticipates that it will take about five to seven months to build the registry and associated automated features that would help with registration and creating public notices. And also um, that SD SDCI noted that this new system needs to integrate with the overall Acela permitting system so that reviewers are able to, to easily confirm that tree service providers are registered as required. Um, the department estimates that the total cost of implementing this proposal this year will be between about $300,000 $300, and $470,000 with roughly half of this amount supported by the general fund and the remainder can be permit fee supported. These costs include outreach, development of the technology to support the registry and temporary staff to support these efforts. The department anticipates requesting this the additional general fund support in the forthcoming mid-year supplemental budget. Um, SDCI will then consider what, if any, ongoing staffing and funding needs might be uh, necessary uh, next year, and these would be included in the 2023 proposed budget. Does anyone have any questions about any of that information? I don't. Colleagues? Seeing none, take it away. Okay. So um, I think we talked about the substitute, so I just wanted to give a chance to ask any questions. Um, uh, the chair very uh, well captured all the, the many different kind of 
big pieces there. Um, I, I want to kind of highlight the hazardous tree permit requirement one. That one's kind of the, I, I would say, the biggest change. Um, and this is, the city already requires that um, anybody removing a tree have the ISA track or tree risk assessment qualification credential. So that is already a requirement. Um, and um, that, but the change here is more around uh, codifying some of the re requirements that are in um, what SDCI has a hazard tree tip that, uh, that they uh, updated a couple years ago that includes this a report about uh, the health of the tree. And, um, but the difference here is that we would have a tree, if the tree that would be removed that is also being deemed hazardous, um, is would meet the city's definition of exceptional. We do this would require that there be two different registered tree ser service providers involved, right? So there would be one who would independently assess the tree and submit the required application materials, and then the other tree service provider would perform the major pruning or removal. So in no case can the the there be just one uh, tree service provider who applies for the permit and performs the removal. So that is. Um, a new requirement that the city does not have, but otherwise the report, the required report, the ISA track credential, those are existing requirements. Thank you, Yolanda. Very helpful. Co colleagues, do you have further questions about the substitute? I'm not seeing any. So I, I think at this time in to keep us moving along um, before we vote on this, just last check, Councilmember Peterson, nothing more to add. Good to go. Sounds great. Uh, I would move to amend Council Bill 120207 as shown in Substitute Amendment 1. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded to amend Council Bill 120207 as shown in Substitute Amendment 1. Will the clerk please call the roll? Member Peterson? Aye. Council Member Nelson? Aye. Council Member Mosqueda? Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Morales? Yes. Chair Strauss? Yes. Five in favor, none opposed. Wonderful. Uh, the motion carries. Um, uh, amendment, substitute amendment one carries. Uh, there is no amendment two. And so we will move to Councilmember Peterson's Amendment 3. Uh, Councilmember Peterson, would you like to describe your amendment? Actually, if um, central staff would describe it, that would sure. be ideal. It's just a paragraph. Sure. Yolanda, take it away. All right. Um, amendment 3 would add an additional report requirement to the subdivision, short subdivision, or boundary line adjustment process. This would require that either a registered tree service provider or a state registered la landscape architect uh, provide a report describing how the design of a proposed subdivision supports the city's policy of maximizing retention of its ex existing trees. Currently, the city only uh, requires that a registered surveyor draw plat maps and does not require an explanation of how the plats were drawn to maximize retention of its ex existing trees. We just note that the subdivision process does not necessarily does not involve permitting development directly, but does usually take proposed development into into account, such as building footprints and vehicular access. Thank you, Yolanda. Councilmember Peterson. Thank you, Chair Strauss. Thank you, Yolanda, for that description. Uh, colleagues, it's just one paragraph. You see that it's um, it's as published um, on the agenda today. It's, it's the same language that was actually in the February 3rd Central Staff Memo on the February 9th agenda. And it basically, it says either a registered tree service provider or Washington State licensed landscape architect uh, will prepare a report. It could be less than a page. Uh, submit it to the director of SDCI. And that's only if there's going to be a subdivision or a boundary line adjustment. And they would simply describe how they're trying to maximize retention of trees. It's not required that the trees be retained. Uh, it's really just if we're trying to get at this goal of yes, yes, and yes, we can 
maximize units, we can maximize trees. It's really about just being more creative and proactive early in the process, configuring the footprint of the proposed building in a way that uh, tries to retain the trees. So it's having trees top of mind earlier in the process. I know that creative architects and landscape architects can, can get this done to maximize both units and trees. And this is just requiring that they put down on paper how they're trying to do that. So I would ask for your support of this amendment. I'm happy to answer questions or try to move it first. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. Um, I, I have some comments, but I will wait to share them. Count, uh, Vice Chair Morales, please take it away. Uh, well, I do have some questions about this amendment, but I don't know if you want to move the amendment first and then have the discussion. I'm happy to do it either way. Sure, maybe I'll share my thoughts, Councilmember Peterson. I'll let you move it, and then we can take up some discussion. And so, I really appreciate Councilmember Peterson the intent behind what you're bringing forward in this amendment today. And I unfortunately will not be able to support the amendment today. While I appreciate your intent uh, to ensure we are maximizing the protection of trees during subdivision process, I do believe that this change will impose added costs on housing without a, dish, a, a new public benefit, as we already have a requirement as part of the subdivision process that applicants must maximize the retention of existing trees and when SDCI reviews applications for subdivisions, one of their responsibilities is to ensure that existing trees are being retained to the maximum extent possible. We've had so many conversations in this committee about the permitting process backlog and, and delays associated with our permitting process. I can't, um, I have to remain committed to those goals of moving this work forward. And I, I um, am wary of adding another layer on today uh, because we do know that every time the city imposes a new requirement for permits, it lengthens the permit review times and adds another cost for producing much needed housing in the city. And I would say that if this was not already on the books, I would feel very differently. Um, and I just want to center my appreciation for you, Councilmember Peterson and your team for bringing this forward. Um, I'll let you move, move the amendment uh, if you should, if you so desire. Thank you, Chair Strauss. Yes, colleagues, I move Amendment 3 to Council Bill 120207 as presented on today's agenda. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded to amend Council Bill 120207 as shown in Amendment 3. Uh, before I move for a vote, we wanted further discussion. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Morales, please take it away. Oh, still on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I think, so I did have a, a brief conversation with Councilmember Peterson about this, um, and I, I'm not sure if, if he or Yolanda would want to answer these questions, but I do have kind of some, I think some sequencing questions about what would happen if the intent here is to maximize retention of trees. Um, you know, then I, my questions are, you know, when is the report due? How long do these kinds of reports take? Would something like this delay the project? Um, is the requirement to submit the report um, to delay or you know to prevent the tree from getting cut down? Or is it just to provide information? So it, it doesn't sound to me like it's required to get approval to cut the tree down. And so that makes me just wonder what the what the point is. <laughs> So maybe Yolanda, if you can kind of walk me through like the sequence of what information we would gather from this and, and what purpose it would serve. Sure, so I, I mean, I think this, as I had mentioned before, the, the subdivision process does not necessarily, it's not permitting actual development, right? So it wouldn't permit removal of trees. Um, it is just kind of, that process is for a developer to show how the lots will be drawn, right? So it's a plat map. Um, and then as an, a part of the approval of that plat map, this report would be required, right? So it, 
prior to SDCI saying, okay, good, your um, subdivision looks good. We we still would, this would be a new report added to that process. Now, in terms of what the report is exactly, uh, that would be, that is up to SDCI. Um, it, it, you know, in my and former life as a landscape architect, I, you know, could imagine writing, you know, a brief paragraph saying that this uh, is drawn in such a way that, you know, this this um, this north lot was kind of configured so that this specific tree uh, was um, maybe kind of in the corner versus in the center of the uh, lot, right? So something like that. Um, so I, you know, it's. It is, um, I think, intentionally vague to give SDCI some um, space to decide what it is that they are, they would think is uh, helpful in terms of decision making and reviewing the uh, plat map that is proposed. Is that helpful? Yeah, I think um, I appreciate it. I think I, I, I'm sort of. I still have the, the sim similar concerns to uh, to Chair Strauss, which is that this feels like an extra layer that doesn't give us a whole lot of information and could potentially delay projects. So I'm not, I'm just not sure I can support this right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda. Thank you very much. Um, and a possible question for either the sponsor or for central staff. It's my understanding that SDCI is currently enforcing retention policies for subdivision and boundary line adjustments. Is that the case? There is an existing policy that states as part of the approval process uh, that the SDCI director shall consider how the proposal uh, maximizes the retention of existing trees. So that you are correct, that is an existing policy. Um, I, to uh, the good sponsor um, and for the chair and the committee, I, I think uh, this is an interesting concept. I am supportive of the intent to make sure that those retention policies are robust. I'm hoping that this actually might be something that we could continue to flesh out a little bit more given the ongoing tree protection ordinances that we will be considering later this year. And I'd be really interested in hearing from the department uh, directly about what, to what extent SDCI is seeing maybe a problem with the current approach, whether we can look for ways to strengthen that enforcement in the upcoming tree protection ordinance, and especially how we can strengthen that without adding additional time um, or processes to the already existing permitting process, which we know just equals additional costs. And if we're thinking about building things like housing, um, additional time and cost to that. So I, I do appreciate the intent here. I think that for me as well, the concern for amendment number three at this juncture without that additional feedback from the department is a potential for unintended consequences and slowing down the permitting process. And I'm um, looking forward to hearing more about how we can avoid unintended impacts on cost and timeline, as well as make sure that we are uh, protecting those um, boundaries. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Mosqueda. Uh, any further comments on the amendment? Councilmember Peterson, would you like last word? Thank you, Chair Strauss. I really appreciate uh, the questions and, and the comments um, from all of you and, and Councilmember Mosqueda's um, vision of like trying to look at this in a comprehensive manner as we move forward as well. Um, I think one of the concerns from some in the community is that you know SDCI is put in a difficult position. They're required to do so many different things uh, with the project, and you know there is a whole movement out there to have trees under you know Office of Sustainability and Environment or some single department. And I think this was just a small step to say, let's be more mindful and creative earlier in the process so that we can do both maximize units and trees. But that that is going to take that won't happen on its own. Uh, and so this was a way of doing it where you have the expertise of the landscape architect or arborist to to opine briefly about how they are maximizing. And that, that could in fact help the SDCI director make a better decision if they are informed by that, that expertise early on by the landscape architect or um, the arborist uh, as part of when there is a lot line adjustment, which is all this is proposing to do. So, so um, 
I'm sure we'll, if this doesn't pass today, we'll see something like it again later in our process. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. And it has been moved and seconded to amend Council Bill 120207 as shown in Amendment 3. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Peterson? Yes. Councilmember Nelson? Abstain. Councilmember Mosqueda? No. Vice Chair Morales? No. Chair Strauss? No. One in favor, three opposed, one abstention. Thank you. Uh, the amendment three to count bill 120207 fails. The motion fails. Uh, we do, I think it has been echoed loud and clear. We all support your intent, Councilmember Peterson, and we all look forward to working with you on this further. Um, our final amendment today is amendment four, which I'm proposing this amendment would change the requirement that public notice be given for three days, the change from just three days before tree removal to three business days to avoid a scenario in which a notice is posted on a Friday for a Monday removal. It also requires that the notice include additional information such as the copy of the tree service providers registration and whether a permit is required for the removal or not. It also clarifies that the hiring entity as in the property owner or manager is responsible for posting the notice. Yolanda, did I miss anything with that? Uh, one, one minor thing is that the tree service provider would provide said notice to the hiring entity. So that is um, one small thing, but otherwise you got it all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, colleagues, any questions, discussion uh, before we vote on this amendment? Seeing none, it's a straightforward one, and apparently I play central staff on TV all right. Um, so I move to amend Council Bill 120207 as shown in Amendment 4. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded to amend Council Bill 120207 as shown in Amendment 4. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Peterson? Yes. Councilmember Nelson? Aye. Councilmember Mosqueda? Aye. Vice Chair Morales? Yes. Chair Strauss? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, amendment four to Council Bill 120207 passes. Uh, we can now move to the passage of the underlying legislation. Uh, before I move that, are there any final comments before we, we vote? And Councilmember Peterson, I'll give you the last word on all of this. Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda, I see you have a hand. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I did want to take a quick second just to thank you, Mr. Chair, and also Councilmember Peterson. Councilmember Peterson, thanks for your leadership um, between the two of you for bringing this bill forward. And I especially want to thank you for the substitute. I didn't really get a chance to comment on the substitute as we voted, but I think the substitute is a great combination of amendments that address some of the equity concerns that we had regarding small BIPOC immigrant owned um, businesses uh, to make sure that there was the ability to collaborate and work with certified arborists. I also appreciate the inclusion of an option to have an arborist or uh, retention that will achieve the same ends of having that expertise on hand while not creating a barrier for those smallest businesses. So thanks for your work on the substitute as well. Um, I did want to ask Mr. Chair uh, of Central Staff here, um, something that I'm going to start doing as more of a practice in our uh, committees that we participate in is really asking Central Staff to lift up before final passage fiscal notes so that we have an opportunity to take a look one more time at the fiscal note. Obviously, this is something that um, I should have probably also uh, called out in the initial briefing of the legislation, but we'll be doing so as just a more routine basis as we look at final passage. So, um, you know, Yolanda, thanks again, um, Ms. Ho, for talking about the uh, fiscal note in your presentation. Uh, you noted that depending on the extent of rulemaking by the director of SCCI to implement the ordinance, there may be city FTE position commitments needed to implement the registration requirement, depending on the number of complaints received. I'm wondering if uh, we might just have you elaborate on that for just a quick second, given the budget situation that we're all in and in together as a city family. Uh, we are looking forward to opportunities to mindfully move forward important legislation like this, as well as as, um, couple these discussions on policy with the fiscal impact since we don't have a traditional system as Councilmember Strauss I know is something you were advocating for last year to have a but a policy committee then a fiscal committee and then full council so would love to take a second if you might um, uh, for central staff to help us identify 
any additional considerations around the fiscal note and if there's a possible funding source again i'll underscore my support for this legislation uh this is not intended to be a roadblock or a um a, a pushing pause conversation by any means i do want to make sure that folks know this is something i'm going to be asking of all legislation but i thought it was a great opportunity for us to show the importance of this legislation while also lifting up the fiscal impacts um and uh be mindful of that as we look at uh, the constraints facing us in this upcoming budget session. Uh, um, I would note that um, STCI is a largely permit fee supported department. And so I think um, I do not know to what extent that, you know, they have their ways of calculating what can be general fund, what can be permit fee supported. And so um, the hope would be that most of the FTE you know, depending, you know, there, there's kind of, there's a body of work that um, I think the complaints and dealing with that may be general fund supported, but I might be getting that reversed, but um, there, there is kind of some, a body of work in SDCI that cannot be permit fee supported, but the vast majority of the work there is permit fee supported. So I think that it will be good for us to understand how much of that ongoing work can be permit fee supported versus, you know, kind of, um on the general fund right and so uh, that that will be i think to be determined as sdci kind of gets this thing up and running um and get, starts to see what you know what the asks of it are and all those uh, things so we we don't quite know and that's why we kind of had to wait so if you look at the fiscal note of this bill it is not going to be particularly informative because i was waiting on sdci's uh, analysis to kind of inform help inform the council on kind of the the fiscal impacts thank you mr chair I'm glad to know that there is a possible revenue source, um, and I think that that will be helpful for the broader conversation, again, that we hope to have later this year. Thank you very much. Uh, I almost said vice chair. Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda, I, very well said, as chair of the Finance Committee, I think that that attention is just completely spot on. One thing that I've noticed in the tree work that we've been doing from a policy level is that when enforcement is is, is conducted for folks that have broken the rules, cutting down trees in environmentally critical areas or without permits, there are fines levied against them. And those fines are returned to the general fund at large, rather than being retained for tree planting, uh, tree maintenance, or, or even just this work that we're discussing here. So I think that there are more ways that we are able to protect trees and fund these programs um, because what's happening right now is those fines are being levied as a deterrent, yet those dollars are not actually helping regrow our, our city's canopy. Well, with that, uh, Councilmember Peterson, any final words? I have no nothing to add. Thank you, Chair Strauss. Thank you. I'm just, it was, I'm just very thankful for you and your team for bringing this forward and for allowing me to co-sponsor. Uh, with that, would you like to move the bill or... I'll do it. I'll, I recommend uh, passage of Council Bill 120207 as amended. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded to recommend passage of Council Bill 120207 as amended. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Peterson? Yes. Councilmember Nelson? Aye. Councilmember Mosqueda? Aye. Vice Chair Morales? Yes. Chair Strauss? Yes. Five in favor and none opposed. Thank you. The motion carries. Council Bill 120207, as amended, passes and will be back before the City Council on Tuesday for a final vote. I want to give a special, a huge thank you to Councilmember Peterson, Yolanda, uh, Toby, and Noah for all working together on this uh, incredible work. Thank you. Up next uh, is our, the next item is a resolution ratifying countywide planning policies. Mr. On, will you please read the abbreviated title into the record? Agenda item three, resolution 32048, a resolution approving and, and ratifying the decision of the Metropolitan King County Council to adopt a revised set of countywide planning policies. Wonderful. This resolution would ratify the recently adopted countywide planning policies for King County. The city can ratify these policies by resolution or by taking no action. We are taking up this resolution as an opportunity to be briefed on the countywide planning policies and to recognize the work that King County has done. We are joined by Eric McConaughey from Council Central staff. 
Uh, Mr. McConaughey, please take it away. Oh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, Eric McConaughey, Council Central Staff. Uh, Chair Strauss, you did a great job of capturing my <laughs> first few bullet points. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, uh, this is an opportunity for the city to just recognize uh, how uh, the city's comprehensive planning, which, as you know, is going into a major update uh, cycle uh, to be um, voted on in 2024, um, that the city's comprehensive planning is nested within uh, overall county planning and regional planning um, members of the city council this year and last year and for many years since 1992, as well as the city's mayor, uh, our representatives on the growth management planning council. And uh, these count countywide planning policies, the amendment process went through multiple meetings at the GMPC. Um, and so uh, this is sort of a culminating moment. And uh, since 2012, when there was the last um, large update to the countywide planning policies, there have been incremental changes. Some of them have been acknowledged by um, the, the, the council, but by and large, um, they have been ratified um, in sort of positive uh, silence. In this case, this would be uh, an active um, action by the council and the mayor to recognize the countywide planning policies for 2021, including the new growth targets. Um, there is a slide deck attached to this agenda, and I blasted right on past before um, asking uh, Noah if maybe he could um, show it to you all. There's a few stats in there that I might want to share with you. I think in my haste, I didn't allow for that to happen. Um, so I apologize for that. Mr. Ron, are you able to share a screen? If not, Here we go. Yeah, thank you, Noah. I really appreciate that. So let's just advance sort of slowly one at a time. Let's see what uh, what maybe uh, the slides could add to this. I think we're good here. Next slide, please. And one more, please. Great. So the Growth Management Planning Council um, directed staff um, of the various cities that, that grouped together, that gathered together um, as the interjurisdictional team, that's King County staff as well as city staff from the various jurisdictions to uh, update the CVP using some guiding principles. Chief among these were to <clears throat> use the 2012 um, CPPs or countywide planning policies as the base to center on social equity and health, to integrate regional policy and legislative changes, to uh, provide some clarity, make things more actionable, and then to implement the 2044 regional growth targets that come from the PSRC vision uh, document for 2050. Next slide, please. Um, the GMPC, uh, by uh, an official motion in June of 2021, recommended these CPPs to the King County Council. The King County Council took them up in committee, um, made some amendments to them, um, and then uh, ratified them <clears throat> in December of last year. Next slide, please. Um, it's, I think, helpful to note that Seattle's 2019 to 2024 targets for new housing units is 112,000 and new jobs, 169,500 new jobs. OPCD, the Office of Planning and Community Development, as you know, is coordinating the work on this along with key departments like the Department of Transportation and others. Um, Department of Neighborhoods, I could go on and on. It's a really integrated process into this effort leading to a new comprehensive plan uh, known as One Seattle in 2024. And uh, it's really um, going to sort of heat up and be more, um, I think, I anticipate being more on the agenda for this committee uh, as directed by the chair and you all to discuss the development of that plan between now and 2024. So next slide, please. Uh, Eric, just on that slide, Yes, please. Quick, uh, I, as we spoke earlier, I know you might not have this information offhand. I am curious about how the 112,000 new housing units targeted by 2024 compares to our understanding of population growth and how many new units we need. It's my back of the envelope understanding that we need 112,000 new units every year, not 40 years. Well, um, the, the general answer is that I can develop some more information to come back to the committee with or share with you, you know, that with you. The uh, target for, um, let's see if I can pull that up very quickly. The, the target under our current planning horizon um, has not been met. So that provides some um, context for that. 
So, um, and I know I asked this question just an hour or so ago. So if you need to follow up with us after. Well, um, I, I think maybe it's helpful just to note that the the there was a uh, housing unit target in the current horizon that we're in 2015 to 2035 of 70,000 new housing units. Um, and with the information that I have through the end of 2021 as compiled by um, uh, our planning department, we're, we've gotten to about 49,000 of those units to kind of give a give context on that. So, um, so the inter thing that's interesting is that the uh, we have an overlap um, in these um, timelines, and and I think maybe it would be great to see in forthcoming presentations how we map from one comprehensive plan to the another to the other for those targets. Overall, however, the idea. Um, in the comprehensive, excuse me, in the countywide planning policies, is that these targets are policy statements for what the cities within the county is are willing to plan for. Um, they're not guarantees that the, that number will be attained or not, but it is a guarantee that the city will plan for that number of units um, as, as well as for jobs. So um, I think more to come. Thank you for your question, and uh, hopefully that context uh, helps a little bit. Does thank you. Let's and we, we can follow up after committee too. Great, thank you. Please, please take it away. Um, let's see. Next slide, please. That's what I thought. Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Uh, one last question: Are is there precedent for Seattle not ratifying these policies? You know, I I did some research um, along those lines uh, in drafting the resolution, and I think early on in the development of the CPPs countywide, there was some um, there was some consternation on the part of the council about some technical aspects of it that I think were resolved subsequent to that. So um, I could dig into that. Uh, that that is sort of um, historic at this point. Uh, we're hearing back. We meaning you know the folks in the county uh, uh, overall are hearing back from various cities now about whether or not they want to ratify um, the CPPs. Um, from Seattle's point of view, um, they're in line with uh, what has been planned. Seattle staff have, have been engaged and Seattle's representation of the GMPC have been positive for these as we've gotten to here. So I'm not in a place where I would recommend anything other than um, either approving this resolution or um, silently letting it uh, be ratified. So, yeah. Wonderful, thank you, Eric. Yeah. Um, Colleagues, any other questions or discussion before we vote on this legislation? Resolution. That's resolution. Resolution, yeah. I am not seeing any at this time. Eric, great work on your briefing. I would like to now move to recommend passage of resolution 32048. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded to recommend passage of resolution 32048. Will the clerk please call the roll? Member Peterson? Yes. Council Member Nelson? Aye. Council Member Mosqueda? Vice Chair Morales? Yes. Chair Strath? Yes. And if you could call on uh, Council Member Mosqueda one last time. Member Mosqueda? Aye. Five in favor, none opposed. Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, the It has been moved. Motion carries. Resolution 32048 passes. Thank you all. This legislation will be at full council on Tuesday for a final vote. Our final item of business today is a briefing. Thank you, Eric. Our Thank final you. Item Thank you. Is a briefing on the industrial. I always lead with maritime and industrial strategies, but everyone keeps trying to switch it up on me. Uh, work that OPCD and Office of Economic and Development are doing. Mr. On, will you please read the abbreviated title into the record? The item four, industrial and maritime strategy report. Thank you. We are joined by presenters from OPCD, OED, and SDOT. Uh, before introducing yourselves, I'll, I'll mention this was a process that was led by Mayor Durkin there was 87% consensus on the recommendations. There were a few people that did not agree with the recommendations. And it is now in a pat. And what I said at the time of P 
people voting on whether or not to support support the recommendations, there were a couple things that I needed as the chair of the land use committee, which is that I needed the mayor to take serious the public safety issues occurring in the industrial area and present a plan to address it. Secondly, that the recommendations would be taken as a, as a whole package and not one by one, which is why we are waiting for the draft environmental impact statement appeals to be resolved before we take up the aspects of legislation that we can take up legislatively. With all of that said, I think that it is important that members of the committee begin digesting and understanding the information within this proposal because it is a long document, because there's a lot of new information that needs to be understood. Uh, and we should get to that now because not everyone on this committee was part of that process. With all of that said, We've got some really great folks here from OPCD. We've got Jim Holmes. We've got John Persack from Office of Economic Development. And I am looking for who our S. Blazon is. Not seeing at the moment. So I'm going to pass it over to Jim. Yeah, and so. Um, take it away, gentlemen. And our Lei Wu here is uh, representing S. as part of our project team here. And I'm going to share my screen to pull up a presentation. All right, so uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about the industrial and maritime strategy. Um, today, we're gonna talk about why this strategy is important, the process and implementation actions to date. We're gonna get into what the proposed land use concepts and EIS alternatives and uh, some of the EIS discussion. So I think the importance of this plan is uh, really reflected by the importance of industrial land to the city. We have two regionally designated manufacturing industrial centers, the Ballard Interbay North End Manufacturing Industrial Center, known as the BINMIC, and the Greater Duwamish uh, MIC. Uh, this MIC designation uh, is a regional designation by PSRC, as well as in our comprehensive plan, and it gives, us pri it gives the city priority for federal transportation funding in these areas. Uh, recertification of our MIC designation is due in 2025. We know that right now there's in, in excess of 95,000 existing jobs within our in industrial mix. Two thirds of these jobs are accessible without a four year degree. Many remain unionized with quality benefits. And starting salaries can exceed 70% of area median income in key fields. And an important fact, uh, part of our industrial lands are the irreplaceable assets, the deep water port and waterways, uh, historical investments in freight and rail infrastructure. So the process to date, um, in 2016, a group was convened to really look at industrial land use around uh, the Soto ST3 station in that area. Um, that work went on for a couple of years, concluded with a series of draft recommendations which in some ways informed the next process, but those were not adopted. Uh, the citywide uh, strategy council that these uh, recommendations come from was convened in the fall of 2019. It was backed by an interdepartmental team of OPCD, SDOT, OED, OSE, SPU, uh, uh, and other city family as needed. Uh, the, me the meetings were professionally facilitated. It included four neighborhood subgroups, one for Ballard, one for Inner Bay, one for Duwamish, and one for the Georgetown and South Park communities. And it also included uh, engagement with BIPOC youth uh, in the summer of 2020. In June of 2021, uh, this group adopted consensus recommendations, uh, 11 strategies that comprise industrial maritime strategy. And there was some early implementation in the 2022 budget. And we also launched the EIS uh, addressing the, the land use recommendations last summer. So the 11 strategies, and I'll keep this high level, involved investment strategies, making workforce investments uh, to help develop a skilled workforce to work with our, in our industrial areas, 
public safety partnerships, increase public safety in our industrial areas, transportation investments, environmental initiatives, um, they, what they call the action items included a recommendation that whatever happens at the Waska site and the Interbay Armory site, that the city is committing to work in a master planning process with the state on those sites. And finally, recognizing the need for a stewardship group to really advance the interests of our industrial areas. The land use strategies include stronger protections for land, industrial land in our mix, um, promoting dense industrial development, almost industrial TOD, around future transit stations, uh, enhancing healthy transition areas where are industrial areas abut non-industrial areas. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. There was a consensus that generally speaking in our core industrial zones, there would be no new residential uses um, and some select areas of Georgetown and South Park were identified for removal from the MIC to advance neighborhood goals. So we started the EIS process last summer, start in uh, July. And we did. Could we, uh, sorry to interrupt, could we go yeah. back to that last slide? I just wanted to hang on this for a minute to see uh, if colleagues have questions on this, or sure. would you prefer questions at the end? I'm fine, either way. Colleagues, I, I was very well versed in all of these because I was in the process where consensus came to these ideas. I just wanted to pause here to see if there's additional information. Come, uh, Vice Chair Morales, please. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could talk just a little bit more about Georgetown and South Park being removed from the MIC. Um, I've had lots of conversation with folks in Georgetown who are very nervous about um, industrial lands, the residential parts of Georgetown having industrial lands expanded into the residential area. Yeah. I know industrial folks don't want residential moving into their area. So um, talk to me about that conversation about removing Georgetown. Yeah. The so it wouldn't be, it's most of Georgetown is not within the MIC. There is a small area that extends, it's kind of bound by Airport Way, uh, Corson and uh, Bailey, it's kind of a triangle shaped area that we propose we study for removal because that's really contiguous to the kind of what we think of as the Georgetown CBD. Um, you know, it might be amenable for mixed use housing. We haven't made that recommendation. We have studied it and that's what came out of this uh, stakeholder process. In South Park, there's an area, um, there's, there's a park and I'll show you on the map in a few slides to show the area, it would just really bring a better connection between uh, the park and downtown to the river's edge. Um, and there's small areas that I think is a total of four acres. Uh, and that was also identified as a potential in our subgroups. But in, as we'll talk, we're in the midst of doing some extensive engagement in that community. And uh, I think uh, we will be able to um, come back with more information about various viewpoints in South Park and Georgetown on those issues. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, John, I don't know if you have anything you want to add as a resident of Georgetown to the conversation there. Yeah, I would just uh, echo what Jim was saying and that I am unaware of anything on the table that would expand the MIC boundaries into anything that is not a mic boundary and i just i think i wanted to highlight that and make that clear thank you all right shall i move on sure. so we started the eis process last summer we held scoping in the summer that started uh in early july during that period we did extensive outreach to different stakeholder groups to make sure they understood the process and how to participate in the scoping process. Uh, in early August, scoping period concluded. We prepared the final scope for the draft EIS and work began on that. We released the draft EIS in December, December 16th of 2021 uh, with a 45 day comment period based on requests we received from the public. We extended that 75 days and um, actually we have extended it further for the Georgetown and South Park communities to April 15th. We anticipate a final EIS will be complete uh, late second quarter. 
um, and following that, it's our hope that we will be able to uh, transmit uh, comprehensive plan amendments that would begin the implementation of the land use recommendations for, for this year's annual amendment cycle. Thank you, Jim. Real quick on that one, given that we saw appeals, and maybe I conflated some things here in my in my earlier comments, my apologies if I did, uh, just given that we saw appeals to the previous SEPA decisions on some of these recommendations, how would this timeline be impacted with any potential appeal for yeah, of that so timeline IS? And those appeals that we received last year, we, we decided to withdraw the legislation and we are studying it in this EIS, which was actually the request of the appeals last year. Um, but we could still get an appeal and that would de definitely add a, a delay. We would not be transmitting comprehensive plan policies um, if we do receive an appeal on the final EIS until 2023. Great, thank you. So we are, what the EIS is studying, what the recommendations of the stakeholder group were, was to look at three new land use concepts that would become zones uh, in our industrial areas. It would replace the existing zones. Uh, the first one is the manu maritime manufacturing and logistics zone. That is really our core industrial zone and would most, most land that is currently in the IG zoning category would be in this category. The industry and innovation is really a response to uh, what do we do about land use around future sound transit stations in industrial areas. And I'll go into more details in a few minutes. And urban industrials to really create vibrant transitional districts where industrial land transitions to non-industrial land. So the maritime manufacturing and logistics concept you know, these are the core industrial areas that benefit by their proximity to, to the port, to the, that rail infrastructure, freight infrastructure. With the stronger protections that we would be proposing through the comprehensive plan, these are areas that businesses would feel that it was economically reasonable to reinvest on site and continue operations in these areas. The industry and innovation concept is what we would place around transit stations or in some around some transit stations um, and this is kind of kind of like a, an idea to go with industrial TOD so what this what you see in this diagram is the first few floors of these buildings are gray and those would be industrial space light industrial space there would be development standards requiring them to be built to industrial standards and then as an incentive building that is the incentive that would allow commercial development above them. And these could be 10 to 12 story buildings um, with fairly generous floor plates. Um, and then the idea is to try to get employment density using the station. So there, you know, we would apply TOD uh, requirements, um, limited parking, um, all the things that you would see in traditional TOD. And finally, the urban industrial concept, uh, these are those transitional areas. I think uh, areas around like the Ballard Brewery District uh, is a good example, where you have a finer grained pattern of development and parcelization, um, but you have increasingly residents from the adjacent areas coming into the industrial area. Um, in the case of the Ballard Brewery District, they're going to tap rooms. Um, there's maker spaces, there's you know things that draw people in rather than just traditional industrial areas. And so we would envision better streetscape designs to create, eliminate safety hazards and conflicts between pedestrians and freight movement, but it would allow these areas to continue to, to serve the community. So a little background on the EIS. The EIS studies a range of alternatives, different choices that we can make. Um, to identify the potential adverse impacts on the built and natural environment. By having a range of alternatives, we understand policy trade-offs between the choices that can be made, the choices that you will make. Um, and then finally, we understand that by also including the no action alternative. What is the impact over 20 years if nothing changes? I'm only gonna show you two alternatives, but they're both, they're the, they span the range of the alternatives. This is the no action alternative. As you see, 90% of the land is currently in that industrial general category. 
five percent is industrial commercial so that's this area around expedia you see it in fremont you see it uh north of i-90 here and then the industrial buffer which doesn't really show up great on this map that's the existing transitional zone you see it on the edge of ballard um I get this out of my way you see it around south park around this edge here you see it surrounding georgetown um, that's five percent so what i'm showing you now is the alternative with the greatest amount of change so in this one the maritime manufacturing and logistics zone has replaced most of that industrial general but it still comprises about 86 percent of total land area in this alternative the industri industry industry and innovation zone comprises about eight percent and so you see that around the soto station and extends down to starbucks center and it continues north along six you see the existing industrial commercial areas placed in this zone category because it's the closest fit uh, you see it by a potential ballard station kind of using 14th avenue as a spine um, and in this alternative, it removes focus areas of land from Georgetown, as we discussed, and South Park. These are very small areas. Um, and it, it, it allows an increase, while there is no new residential uses being proposed in the vast majority of the industrial areas, in their urban industrial zone, in two of the alternatives, and this is the one that studies the most housing, we would expand the caretaker quarters provisions from one per business to uh, you know as high as 50 per acre, but it would need to be part of a project uh, with industrial activity. And so in this alternative, we could see as many as 2,000 new dwelling units within uh, the, the mix. So as we've gone through this process, the Georgetown and South Park communities reached out they felt that they really needed uh, a little more in terms of the kind of outreach that would help residents in those areas participate in this process so we extended the comment period to april 15th um, we are working with a collaboration of neighborhood organizations uh, to reach out to residents in these neighborhoods because they experience greater impacts from proximity to industrial activity uh, next week, we will be having two community meetings, one in South Park, one in Georgetown. We'll also be having a virtual meeting to anybody who wants to log in. And then we're having a series of drop-in hours, very informal events where there will be a couple members of city staff at a coffee shop with materials for a few hours and people can drop by and talk to us informally and ask questions. Um, we, and we are providing translation services for many of these events in Spanish, Somali, and Vietnamese. So the next steps, we are preparing the final EIS for release at the end of the second quarter, 2022. As, assuming no appeal, we would submit comprehensive plan amendments for consideration in 2022. We would prepare zoning regulations for consideration in 2023. And we would update the center's plans for the Binmik and the Duwamishmik, which is a PSRC requirement for recertification of their manufacturing industrial centers uh, designation. And that concludes the presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. John, anything to, to add there? You were an active participant in a different role and glad to have you in the city family to keep this, move, this work moving. Uh, sure, Council Member Strauss, thank you. Um, I guess the, the only thing I could add is more of a, a philosophical note, I guess, um, just in terms of how uh, many of these areas have evolved over the year where you have um, a conflict between, you know, the sense of place and what is actually happening in these areas versus the utility of maritime and manufacturing. And for a number of years, uh, we've kicked that can down the road, and I think we've reached a point where we really need uh, to bring out the data and to really understand what we're dealing with so that we can make a decision and resolve a lot of these long-standing uh, differences of opinion and misunderstandings and conflicts around, you know, various places around uh, the mix. Um, also, uh, a key part 
of the industrial maritime strategy is the workforce development piece. And that fortunately is not contingent on many of the outcomes in this uh, environmental impact. So, you know, from the perspective of OED, we can do workforce development now. We can prioritize uh, the recommendations uh, in the policies, uh, the policy table that supports the recommendation for workforce development. And we can begin to take a look at those and, and implement some of those and fund some of those. So um, that's all I would have to say on that. So um, I'll just cut it off here. Thank you. Well said, John, and I was on mute uh, just a second ago as I started speaking. So well, uh, thank you for those comments. Colleagues, do you have further questions or comments? And we can have this information back before council again. Uh, Vice Chair Morales, please take it away. Thank you. Um, well, Jim and John, thank you very much for being here, for um, sharing kind of the, the process that you went through and some of the initial alternatives that you're offering. Um, I. I think this is really more of a statement. Um, I just want to say two things. Um, the first is that for us as policymakers, I think it's really important that we um, assess the economic impact in addition to the environmental impact and the um, sort of industry and sector impacts in order for us to make a sound decision. Can you talk about whether there will be any analysis of the economic impacts of these changes? Um, and I'm especially interested in understanding um, the different impacts on the two mix, because I, I do anticipate that there will be disproportionate benefits um, and impacts in Ballard and Duwamish. They're very different areas, um, and especially as it relates to transportation, to housing, to job growth. Um, I think it will be important as we move through this process to to differentiate um, between the two parts of town. Um, I don't have to tell you that, you know, there is a, a, a legacy of contamination in the Duwamish. Um, you know, we've got folks who do subsistence fishing uh, in the Duwamish. And I just, I, I think it's going to be important as we move through this over the next year or two um, to be very intentional about um, calling out the different impacts that these changes will have on the different communities. Well, go for it, Tim. Yeah, we have done an abbreviated economic study that's really about employment projections of the different alternatives. Um, that's on our website and I can send that to you uh, to make sure you have that. Um, a lot of the impacts, I think, I think that you're talking about impacts on housing supply and the need for housing? What are the impacts of increased truck traffic as these can, areas continue to have it, you know, in terms of air quality, in terms of noise, in terms of uh, increased workforce, uh, in terms of open space? Um, a lot, much of that is in the draft EIS in sections of the environment. And, and I know it's a very dry document and I apologize for that, um, but the, I, if there are areas you are specifically interested in, you know, the summary is a great map to, to know where to go to look in that document to get specifics. I would also add that there's an equity analysis that shows how the impacts on different elements of the environment um, are disproportionately affect some areas more than others, um, which is also a useful uh, a tool to look at. Yeah, I think, Chair, if I may, um, the the point I want to make is that, um, you know, I know we're talking about industrial area and people don't necessarily live in these areas, but they live next to them. Right. Um, and so I do think it is still important to, um, to, to center the people who are going to be impacted by this, um, you know, not just the businesses, not just sound transit, although the fact that there's 14 stations going through this raises a whole set of other questions for me that we can talk about later. But um, but I I do think that um, calling out the differences uh, in the way that people in the surrounding communities will be impacted, whether it's access to jobs or access to housing or ac you know health, air quality, water quality, noise, all of that um, is going to be different for folks in the Duwamish than it will be for folks in Ballard. Um, and so I don't know. Maybe the chair and I can kind of play good cop bad cop here. Um, but I think it's going to be important to, um, 
to acknowledge that and to be ready to have those conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. And those um, conversations will come up, although there are a few hurdles that have to be uh, overcome before it comes to us. And that's why I think that it's important for us to start digesting this now so that we don't try to do all of our learning right in the last minute. So we'll probably have Jim and John back with us again before not too long, just for an update on how things are going. Colleagues, any other questions? I'm seeing none. Uh, Jim, John, I really, really appreciate you coming and look forward to continuing following this work as the EIS process moves forward and we'd love to have you back. Thank you for all your hard work on this because it's been a number of years worth of work uh, that was put on pause by the pandemic that was restarted uh, with a whole new set of challenges. Uh, and it was incredibly impressive to see such a range of opinions get to uh, such a high threshold of agreement, even if it wasn't the perfect solution for everyone. And I think that that's really what uh, compromise and consensus can, can build at times. So thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and thank you to Chase Kitchen and the mayor's office for leading this work last year and the year before. And we'll have you back. Wonderful. And so uh, colleagues, if there's no other business, I will conclude this meeting. Anything for the good of the order? I'm seeing none. So this does conclude, conclude, before we conclude, I will mention that the next regularly scheduled meeting of the land use committee on April 13th will be canceled. So our next land use committee will be on Wednesday, April 27th, starting at 2 p.m. Uh, with nothing further, this does conclude the Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022 meeting of the land use committee. We thank you for attending. We are adjourned.